So as we talked about at the end of the last section, um, one of the ways that we ensure that governments don't go off the rails and start abusing power and, and doing awful things is that we have institutions in place that kind of keep them in their place and hold them accountable. Um, the whole idea of, of keeping a government with so much power is that there's this this responsibility to be accountable to its citizens. And one method for ensuring accountability is to rely on democracy. And we talked about this in the first session here where um, democracy includes a whole bunch of different aspects and different key institutions that, that formulate democracy. There's not one universal definition of democracy. Um, you have all sorts of different flavors of democracy. Um, but at its core, kind of the main institutions that we care about in, de in a democratic system are these three here, where you have the rule of law, um, where everybody is kind of held to the same legal standards and laws apply equally to everybody, um, regardless of race and class and background and your parents, um, everybody's kind of held to the same law. Um, you have civil liberties where everybody's guaranteed um, kind of a minimum baseline of human rights, um, regardless, again, of race and class and background and other things, where everybody should have kind of the same standard set of rights. Um, and then the third is this idea of having inclusive, free, and decisive elections, where people are able to voice their policy preferences during elections, and as a result, um, um, policies can change and can reflect the will of the electorate. And so as long as you have some degree of these three types of institutions, then you can generally consider yourself a democracy. No country has all three of these things perfectly. Um, even in like Scandinavia, like Denmark, um, there are deficiencies in these three different institutions here. Um, but as long as like countries are trying to meet these things and actively working towards promoting the rule of law, enhancing civil liberties and, and holding inclusive, free and decisive elections, then we can talk about you know, a democratic society. And the reason this is important for policy and for economics is that um, because of elections here and because of citizen involvement and where the government is respecting everybody, um, the policy choices that countries make often um, reflect the uh, preferences of its population. So if you look at this chart that came from your core reading here, um, this shows how three different countries allocate spending um, of government funding on a whole bunch of different um, um, categories here. We have military spending and social spending and education spending and health spending and all sorts of things that kind of reflect a, a country's priorities. So if you look at Finland, 43% um, of their GDP is spent on social protection, on a social safety net and ensuring that people have access to um, daycares and unemployment insurance and uh, health care and a whole bunch of other things. Like this is all like Finland cares about that heavily. Um, and that's not necessarily because the government just decided that we care about healthcare. It's because the people um, were able to kind of voice their, their preferences and therefore they have a, a huge social safety net because of, of the will of the people. The United States has completely different um, policy preferences where our social safety net spending is only 20% of GDP. We spend a ton more on healthcare um, because it's really expensive to have healthcare in, in this country. We spend a, a big chunk on the military. M Finland only spends 2.5% of its GDP on that. We spend like 10% um, because, again, this reflects kind of our national preferences here. And then South Korea also has a different allocation here. I'm kind of in between the U.S. and Finland here. Um, so what we end up having is all sorts of different policy preferences um, that are based on kind of what voters want. Um, in theory, if you have a perfectly working democracy. But if you don't, um, then often the policy preferences that get embedded in here um, reflect the, the wants and desires of other organizations in society. Um, there are lots of different polls um, and experiments that political scientists have done that have people kind of set a, a national budget. They say, here's here's a million dollars, allocate this million dollars to different departments in the government. And often people will give a lot more to international aid and to, um, to like medical care and Medicare and Medicaid and kind of those areas and give a lot less to the military. And then when you line it up with what it actually looks like with government spending, it's, it's often way out of sync with what is actually happening in reality. 
So each of these countries have some sort of policy preferences that are enshrined in actual public policy, and these things get set by lots of different things. It could be that citizens express their desires for a more robust safety net or a stronger military or um, more, more uh, funding of public education, other things. Um, but it could also be that other interest groups are getting involved in the policy process and distorting kind of the ideal um, policy preferences of the electorate. And so what ends up happening, um, and the reason why we're talking about this in an economics class, is that you might have like the most ideal, perfect um, economic model that shows that um, this policy is going to be the best, the costs um, are definitely outweighed by the benefits, you should absolutely do something. But as soon as you introduce politics into the situation, um, the whole situation can collapse. So you end up with something like this. Um, where you'll have a great model and then as soon as you introduce politics to it, it just kind of crashes and burns. And you see this happen all the time in real life, um, where the interests of smaller groups or the interests of larger lobbying organizations can distort what people actually want. Um, and so we need to take that into account when we analyze economic policies. We need to think about politics. Um, and so one good way of looking at this is to start with um, this argument that was first laid out by um, James Madison in the Federalist Papers. And so the Federalist Papers were a series of essays that were written in the late 1700s after the Constitution was drafted um, to help convince people that um, the Constitution should be ratified by the different states. Um, they were written by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and John Jay. Um, Alexander Hamilton wrote the majority of them, um, John Jay wrote a few, and then Madison did a bunch. Um, the Federalist 10, which you read for today, is one of the more famous ones. It was written by James Madison. And in this, he makes an argument um, for why Republican type of governments, not the Republican Party, um, but the, this idea of having kind of a federation of smaller states that all come together in kind of a larger government, why this actually helps protect the rights of uh, people in the, um, in the country. And it makes it so that people in a country are not ruled by um, the whims of smaller groups of, of interests, but kind of ruled by the general um, policy preferences of the majority in the country. Um, and so what his argument is in Federalist 10 here is that factions or small groups of people are potentially dangerous, especially if they're able to gain political power and then impose their will on the majority of the country. Um, throughout his um, argument here, he does talk about minorities. Um, that does not mean marginalized groups or anything like that. It just means small groups of people with different policy preferences that have access to a political system. So whenever you see minority in the Federalist Papers, that's not what he's talking about. Um, it's not marginalized groups that don't have access. It's um, interest groups that do have access. Um, and so in the Federalist Papers here, he says that you can fix this whole problem of having factions exert too much influence on, on politics by either removing their causes and making it so that they can't organize into interest groups, which kind of goes against the whole notion of like freedom of association, or you minimize their effects and make it so that it is hard for small interest groups to weigh in um, and exert too much influence on policy. And so his main argument here is the way you do this is by making a big republic and making big organizations and making big political parties that um, allow for more people to get involved. Um, the main thinking here is that um, having um, all sorts of wise elected representatives filter and sift through legislation um, that comes from a whole bunch of different um, uh, people who are concerned citizens that are part of larger groups, um, it allows um, them to have say over kind of these minority, smaller special interest groups and prevent them from getting access to the political system and then um, makes for better policy essentially. Um, so his, his main finding here, his main quote here is that you should extend the sphere, make the republic as big as possible, make groups big so that it's less probable that a majority will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens. You don't want a small interest group kind of taking over the system and making it get shaped in their favor. And so Madison wanted this to happen. He didn't want small groups to eventually take over and impose their will on everybody else. Um, there are a few problems with this argument. It was, it was very kind of pie in the sky and optimistic. 
um, but also it was kind of redundant here. Um, because um, in the constitutional system that Madison helped set up, there are inherently minorities that have lots of power. Um, again, minority not meaning like um, marginalized groups in society, but um, small groups of people. So if you look at the Senate, each state gets two senators. Um, and so if you're Wyoming with, it's like the smallest state population wise, you get two senators um, that can um, make policy in the Senate. If you're in California, where you have millions of people, um, they also only get two senators. And so you have politicians from Wyoming and from other smaller states that get to wield all sorts of power over larger states in the Senate. Um, and there are all sorts of veto points where like a single senator can hold up um, legislation through a filibuster. Um, so they can be like a small state senator that wields all sorts of power, which means the interest groups in Wyoming and in smaller states like Nebraska and Iowa, they can help influence policy that is like pro agriculture and pro the industries that work in, in Wyoming and other smaller states. And so in that instance, um, smaller groups of, of in, of political interests and, and commercial interests are able to exert influence in, in the political system, which kind of goes against what Madison was hoping. He was hoping for this large thing that would keep um, little groups out of it, but the very constitution allows for little groups to kind of um, veto different parts of the process. Um, his argument was also made before the Bill of Rights. Um, and so he wrote the Bill of Rights later and they added the first 10 amendments that made it so um, that the majority essentially was unable to infringe on the rights of smaller groups. Um, we have freedom of the press and freedom of religion and freedom of um, assembly and speech. Um, and all of these things were uh, enshrined in the constitution so that if a majority took over um, and tried to impose its will on smaller groups in society, it wouldn't be able to. It wouldn't be able to lock people out of power um, or out of access to the political system. And so it was kind of all like, um, like it, it's helping out minorities essentially, which is what he was, or minority groups, small special interest groups, um, which is what he was also going against at the same time. Um, another thing is he assumes that there will be a multi-party system where ideally he wants all of these different groups to um, um, come together in large parties all around the Republic and they can express their ideas and then those party representatives can come to Congress and debate the ideas and it can all filter out. Um, and that's what he was hoping for. But um, because of kind of laws of how political science works, um, the very nature of the American political system means that we are essentially locked into a type of two-party system. Um, there's this idea called Duverger's Law that was um, discovered by a, a political scientist a long time ago that essentially finds that if you have an electoral system where a plurality of votes means that you win, so you don't need a majority, you don't need like 51% to be elected, you just need the most votes. Um, and if you have single member districts in Congress, um, what you end up having almost um, inevitably is a two party system. Um, and so you'll often hear people complain that we need a third party in America, we need a fourth party in America, we need more ways of expressing our policy views. Um, you don't feel represented by the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Um, most efforts to create a third party ultimately fail um, because of Duverger's law here, because of how our electoral system is set up. Um, we have plurality rule elections and we have single member districts. And so we inevitably kind of get stuck into this two party system. And it's been that way since the beginning. Um, the founders of the constitution hoped that there wouldn't be um, a two party system. They hoped for lots and lots of parties, kind of like a parliamentary system like they have in England, um, in the United Kingdom. And it didn't end up doing that. Um, within just a few years, we settled into two parties and we've had those two parties ever since. Um, there's this fascinating infographic data visualization here. If you click on the link, you can see it, um, where it shows just the timeline of party control in the United States since um, George Washington up until, I think they last updated it in like 2018, possibly 2019 here. And so if you look, these two thick ribbons here show which party is in power at what point in time. Um, and it basically switches back and forth between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. 
you can see little offshoots sometimes where people create third parties um, either as offshoots of one of these two main parties or just a brand new thing. So the Libertarian Party here was created in the mid-1970s, beginning of the 1970s, and it's continued ever since, but it's been small and it will always be small. Um, these other parties kind of emerge and then either disappear or get reabsorbed back into one of the main overarching umbrella parties. Um, and that's just how the party system here works um, because of Duverger's law. We're kind of locked into this, into this system. And so rather than having like a coalitional type of government where um, like in lots of European countries where they have a parliament with all sorts of parties that after a parliamentary election, they have to um, coordinate with each other and create coalitions to, to govern. Um, each of those parties have very narrow interests um, and very specific policy preferences. Um, and so you can join specific parties, per specific branches of like a labor party, um, for instance. Um, but in the United States, we can't do that. And so we get really, really giant parties um, like the Democratic Party, where you have people who are very, very moderate, um, almost kind of bordering on conservative of uh, policy preferences. And then you get people like Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who are far left within the, within the Democratic Party. In another political system, like a parliamentary system, they would be in a labor party or some other uh, more left party and would be involved in some coalitional government. But in the United States, they're just all part of kind of these broader, big political parties. Um, and Madison didn't foresee that. Um, he was hoping that these little ribbons would be a lot thicker, but just the way the, the, way the electoral system here is structured, that's just how it is. Um, Another thing that Madison didn't anticipate, his whole argument again, was that we need to have big organizations, um, a big Republican government that keeps small interest groups out. Um, he didn't anticipate that small group dynamics um, actually endow these groups with a lot more power than we think, um, where these small factions will have a lot more power because of how they operate within themselves and the incentive structures that you see in these organizations. Again, one more time to reiterate this, when we see this word minority here, when we're talking about interest groups, it does not mean marginalized groups. It does not mean um, African Americans are going to take over the government or Native Americans are going to take over the government or any marginalized group that has been systematically denied access to the political system. That's not what this means. When, when political scientists talk about this whole minority thing, it really just means a small interest group that is interested in some sort of policy and it has access to the political system to, to kind of carry out that policy. And so it's, it, that's the kind of, of minority we're talking about here. And so a better term that is often used is this idea of interest groups where you have groups of um, companies or lobbyists or citizens that can band together and kind of lobby for change. And so that, that's what we're talking about here with this minority idea.